Hey guys, uh, my name is Gassid Sadik, and I'm an engineer on the Android Accessibility Team. So, uh, getting right into it, uh, if you use standard widgets, like the ones that we provide for you in the platform, Android X, and Material, you're going to have accessibility built in out of the box. And you're going to have a pretty easy time doing accessibility work, mostly doing things like adding labels. But if you have to write your own custom widgets or your own UI toolkit or anywhere in between, that story is going to get a little bit more complicated. You're going to need to do quite a bit of the accessibility heavy lifting. So to understand why, I'm going to walk you through one of the widgets that we worked on internally in terms of accessibility. And through this, you'll get to understand a little bit more about the accessibility system. You get to understand the challenges that you're going to face when you're doing this sort of work. And you also get to understand how to scope accessibility work beforehand, because that can be a little bit unpredictable. Now, before we get into that story, let's talk about accessibility at a high level real quick. So there's your user, and that's your UI. Your UI presents information to the user, information like the content that they want, and information on how to act on that UI. Your user takes that, and they act on your UI to make it do things. And that's a complete user experience. If any part of that is broken, even subtly, then your application is broken as far as the user is concerned. Now, that seems simple enough, but when you take into account accessibility and all the dramatically different kinds of accessibility users and the ways that they interact with the world, things get a lot more complicated, right? Because we have all these disabilities and we have variances in these disabilities. We've also got uh, combinations of these disabilities. So we really don't expect you as app developers to figure out each and every single one of these users, make profiles for them, and build a separate interface for each of these users. That would be overwhelming and a pretty good way of creating an awful accessibility experience across applications. Instead, what we have is we have the concept of an accessibility service. Now, an accessibility service is an application which takes the UI presented and adjusts it for a particular kind of user. So for example, TalkBack is an accessibility service. It takes information presented visually and it speaks out loud to a user with visual impairments. Similarly, switch access allows a user with mobility impairments to drive the whole UI with a series of switches, even as little as one. Now, the way an accessibility uh, does this is it consumes a generic representation of the information presented on screen through the accessibility framework. So your task as an app developer becomes pretty simple, or simpler. Uh, make sure that every single thing that your application presents to the user is expressed to the accessibility service, and make sure the accessibility service can act in your application or your UI any way that a user can. So let's actually go a little bit more in depth in terms of this interface between an application and the user. We're gonna break into the lower levels of this. There's three core objects to this. The first one is an accessibility node info. An accessibility node info represents what's currently on screen. Each accessibility node info typically, but not always, there's a few notable exceptions, corresponds to a view. It captures information like its position on screen, the text, the content description associated with it, what you can do to the uh, view, and a bunch of other stuff related to state and other things. You can see that once we take into account parent and child relationships, you'll have a node tree similar to a view hierarchy. And you can see that the accessibility service through this will have a pretty good understanding of all of the information presented on screen. So now that the accessibility service can query for what's on screen, it needs to know when to query. And that comes from an accessibility event. This is something that's sent from the application to the accessibility service whenever a change happens within your UI. Let me walk you through an example. Let's look at this view hierarchy on the left and the node tree on the right. And let's focus on that green highlighted view. So if something changes in that view, like its sub view is removed, an accessibility event is sent from the highlighted view. The accessibility service knows to invalidate that part of the node tree hierarchy and query for a new one, and now it has the updated representation of what information is being presented to the user. Now, at any given moment, the accessibility service has an accurate representation of what's on screen. But what's missing at this point is the ability for the accessibility service to act on your UI, typically on behalf of the user. That's captured in an accessibility action which is an object which effectively maps uh, an action ID, which could be something like a standard action like scrolling or clicking or long pressing, to a bit of code that you want executed when something like that happens. So with these core pieces, we can start talking about the main story, which is view pager two, which is a widget we're gonna talk through today. So several months ago, a couple of my colleagues, Jell and Jacob, decided that they're gonna make a new version of view pager. One not tied to the issues that ViewPager 1 is stu uh, stuck to, partially because they're going to utilize the power and the flexibility of RecyclerView. 
And they did the right thing, and very early on in the development process, they approached the accessibility team, which is uh, me and my colleagues, and they asked us, hey, can you guys help us do accessibility for this? And one of my colleagues, Sally, said, yeah, of course I can, and she jumped right into this. This is the work that she did. So before anything else, we need to understand what a view pager is. It's effectively a view that allows you to flip through a series of pages. These pages can be views themselves, hierarchies, fragments, whatever you expect. And because the, way, the core of this functionality is allowing the user to flip through a page, we can start there in terms of accessibility. We want to expose the ability for a user to go from one page to another to the accessibility service. And if you remember, that can be done through something like an accessibility action, which captures user actions. So we're going to use a high-level API, viewcompat.replaceaccessibilityAction, and we're going to take override the standard behavior for the action accessibility scroll backward. And we're going to override it for this particular view. So whenever the user asks the its accessibility service to scroll something backward on this view, this code over here, or this lambda, is going to be called, which fundamentally decrements the page count. Set current item, sets the current page. Now we can do this for action scroll forward also. Let's throw this into a function update page accessibility actions. And we'll call this on initialize or something so this exists on the view pager. Now, the accessibility node info associated with this view pager has these two uh, custom actions on it, accessibility scroll backward and accessibility scroll forward. That's great, but if you flip to the first page, action scroll backward is still there. This is a bit of a lie because the user can't scroll backward and neither should the service be able to either. So we're going to add a condition to this. Let's not add an action scroll backward on the first page. Let's not add an action, let's not add an action scroll forward on the uh, last page. And because our state of actions is not dependent on the state of the view or the current item, let's clear out any uh, these actions before we add them again so we don't leave anything stale on it. And let's call update page accessibility actions on set current item because that's a dependent state. Now, the actions are correctly reflected based on the page number. Now, view pager also has something, uh, also has a vertical orientation or a concept of orientation. And this brings up an interesting point. Although technically action scroll forward and scroll backward uh, still allow you to use this view pager in a vertical fashion, and it makes complete sense, there's still something missing here, which is a concept of absolute direction. Certain accessibility services care a lot about this. Like someone driving the, their UI through their voice may say scroll up or scroll down. And this is something that's obviously presented to the user in a very subtle way, so we have to present it to the accessibility service. So we're going to add some uh, actions which allow the user to flip through pages in an absolute direction. And that comes an action page up and down or left and right depending on the orientation. And again, we do the same thing. We invalidate the actions beforehand and we uh, update the actions whenever the relevant state changes. So now we not only have logical actions, but we also have absolute direction actions. And we have it for the horizontal orientation also. Now this talk about logical direction versus absolute direction may get you thinking about another case, which is right to left UI. So over here, Urdu is being displayed, which is a language that's laid out right to left. And the first page is on the far right. So for this, again, we do something similar. We, uh, based on whether it's right to left, we flip action page right and action page left. And again, we go through this whole cycle of invalidating actions, updating state, and you get it. So now, regardless of localization, our actions are added correctly. Now, at this point, our user is able to do, or our accessibility service is able to do anything to this uh, view pager that our user can do to it. But this view pager is also presenting information. In this particular implementation, it's indicating stuff like a page count. And that was missing to the accessibility service. So the way we're going to do this is we're going to break up, the, uh, open up the API, and we're going to mess with the relationship between the view and the accessibility node info. We do that by overriding on initialize accessibility node info on the view. And the particular thing that we care about is collection info. Now, collection info is an object on accessibility node info that uh, helps represent view groups with a uniform set of views uh, below them. So for example, um, a list view has a collection info. Certain recycler views have collection infos, tab layouts do, and now our view pager is going to have that too. We're going to get the row count, column count, throw that into the collection info, and we're going to associate that with the accessibility node info. Now, you may be wondering why everything over here is accessibility node info compat and why we're wrapping uh, the original accessibility node info. Accessibility node info itself is an object on the, in the platform. 
Accessibility Node Info Compat is an object in Android X. Now, we, we ask app developers to wrap their node infos in node info compats because that allows us to backport API back to API 19. It also allows us to backport certain bug fixes back to API 19. So in general, this is just good practice, even if you're not utilizing a new API that you can't use on an older device. OK, so that's great. We're, for the most part, representing our view pager pretty well to the accessibility service. But with a little bit of testing, we find that that page count starts to go stale. And to understand where this bug came from, you kind of have to understand how ViewPager really works. See, ViewPager doesn't manage its items itself. And instead of the sub-view of a recycler view, which manages its items. And whenever a change happens to the ViewPager, the recycler view sends the accessibility events. The, when the accessibility service receives those events, it invalidates that part of the hierarchy and requeries re for it. Notice how that ViewPager was never queried for again. So now all of the information associated with it is stale, including that column count that was, surf that was surfacing the page count. So what we can do in this situation is we made sure that the accessibility events for the changes that we cared about were sent from the view pager instead of the recycler view. Now, our view pager it not only allows the accessibility service to act on it in every way that a user can, but it's presenting all of the information uh, to the accessibility service that it presents to the user. And some of that was done through the accessibility framework. I mean, I mentioned the current index. That was already done through the accessibility framework based on code that was used in Recycler View. So that was probably a good call by Jell and Jacob to use Recycler View here. But it sounds great, but you guys may have noticed that a lot of these fixes involved were a little bit more complicated and a little bit hard to come across if you don't have, if you don't have an intimate knowledge of accessibility. And in fact, some of these things, they don't seem as straightforward as you think. Like, for example, you look at accessibility scroll forward and accessibility page right. Why isn't it page forward or why isn't it scroll right? Why can't we do something that seems a little bit more consistent? And some of this has to do with the fact that this is legacy code and we're working with certain older accessibility services that need to be supported, right? Some of it has to do with the fact that this API is pretty complicated. So because of all of this nuance and age and complexity and the lower level accessibility APIs, the more you try to work here, the more difficult your life is going to be. The more you're going to really need to understand accessibility even beyond what the documentation presents. And this is captured in this chart over here. This is our observation of how much accessibility work you're going to need to do based on how custom your UI is. And this is our, our observations from inside Google. So, at the easiest end, what we hope everyone does, but really realistically is not possible, is that you use all the standard widgets we provide to you in your frameworks. These come with accessibility built in out of the box, and all you have to do is label your images, which shouldn't take long at all. Now, once you move into a new widget territory, you can see this is where things start getting more non-trivial, like we just saw with ViewPager, which was a reasonably well-built bi well widget, which utilized some other uh, standard widgets, but things were kind of complicated. And if you have to start building a new UI toolkit or a new UI platform, it's going to be very, very complicated. You're going to need multiple engineers working full time on accessibility to make sure you don't hurt your accessibility users. So what we encourage you to do is move to the far to the left of this chart as possible. And if you really have to be on the right side of this chart, then make sure you are honest about how much work it's going to take and you allocate those resources because if you don't, you're choosing to hurt your users in this way. Now, the last bit that I want to touch upon, which is kind of important, is testing. Uh, it's surprisingly easy to ship bugs with accessibility, uh, especially because accessibility is not a use case or a code path that's exercised often. So there's a couple obvious ways of testing. The first is uh, just open up the accessibility services yourself. Run TalkBack, run Switch Access, see how it works. Typically, this is a good way of finding those very subtle bugs that don't seem that significant when you're writing code, but turn out to be very frustrating for users. The other is uh, unit testing or automation testing. These take typically two forms. One is you perform an action on a view and you check the state on the view. And the other is you create some state on a view and you create an accessibility node info based on that view and you check to see that the node info state reflects that view correctly. So the two really big key takeaways here, uh, if you guys didn't pay attention to any other part of this, the two things that you can't forget about are first, everything that you express to your user, you have to express to the accessibility service. If you don't, then what you're saying is you don't want the accessibility user to be able to, uh, able to consume that UI or act on your UI in that way. And the second is, 
your accessibility work scales dramatically with the amount of custom UI you have. So again, try to use standard widgets as much as possible. Try to avoid using custom UI as much as possible so you can really focus on the value that your application or your UI delivers to the world. And if you really have to uh, write your own UI, because there are warranted situations for that or your own custom widgets, then just be very honest about how much uh, accessibility work it's going to take and scope it in advance and dedicate those resources. Otherwise, you're going to catch yourself in a situation where you're about to ship and you, ha you have an inaccessible product and it's going to look pretty awful and you're going to hurt your users pretty badly. Either way, thank you guys for your time. I really appreciate it. <laughs>